Since the 1970s, movies have become increasingly dependent on digital technologies. At this point in the 21st century, all aspects of the medium we call movies have been dominated by digital technologies, from production and post-production, to exhibition and distribution. For most of us, digital technology and cinema go hand in hand, but for scholars and theorists of film, this transformation of a previously analog medium to a digital one created something of an identity crisis. Most theorists of film throughout the 20th century began from the assumption that the medium of film is based on the medium of photography, and photography, unlike painting, has a unique relationship with material reality. The digital changed all that, or at least it seemed to. In the 2000s, a number of major books and articles in film studies proclaimed all the different ways that the emergence of digital technology changed the essence of the medium. The most common argument was that, with the ease of digitally manipulating the image, cinema was no longer uniquely tied to material reality. In Lev Manovich's words, digital cinema constituted a return to animation, because with the proliferation of digital image manipulation, recording the material world became only a small component of filmmaking. But this isn't the entire story. In his book, Cinema in the Digital Age, Nicholas Rombies argues that just as there was this widespread turn toward cinema's new capacities to depict fantasy worlds, or at least have an almost godlike control over the contingencies of the material world, there was also a turn in the opposite direction. In the 1990s and early 2000s, there was a turn toward realism and an embracing of contingency and imperfection and a general aesthetic roughness. In Rombies' words, digital cinema is haunted by a double logic, the striving for ever greater realism via a technology and interface that continually calls attention to the artifice of the medium. Let's take a look at how this double logic manifests itself in the year 1995. The highest grossing film in 1995 was none other than Pixar's Toy Story, the first feature-length computer animated film. The same year, Casper became the first feature film to have a fully CG character in the lead role. These were major landmarks of Hollywood's embrace of digital imagery that would continue to expand over the next 25 years. But 1995 was also the year of Dogma 95 a filmmaking movement started by Danish directors Lars von Trier and Thomas Vinterberg that centered around 10 vows of chastity, which committed filmmakers to certain principles of cinematic realism, like shooting must be done on location, and music must not be used, and optical work and filters are forbidden. By refusing expensive and spectacular visual effects and post-production manipulation, Dogma 95 clearly emerged at least partly as a response to the artifices and excesses of Hollywood's increased use of digital technologies. But one of the great ironies of Dogma 95 is that a majority of the films associated with the movement were digital, just not in the same way as Toy Story or Casper. Dogma films didn't use any CGI, but they primarily used handheld digital cameras. What Rombies calls the double logic of digital cinema, then, might be clarified by breaking the digital of digital cinema into two separate components, the digital camera on the one hand and digital animation and visual effects on the other. It turns out that these two aspects of digital filmmaking have almost diametrically opposed qualities, especially when it comes to familiar ways of thinking about cinema's relationship to quote-unquote reality. On the one hand, when we think of digital animation and digital visual effects, we tend to think of synthetic creations like CG creatures and computer-generated worlds. We think of the creation of digital environments and crowds. And we think of fixing errors in post-production. Each of these possibilities pushes cinema away from its photographic ties to material reality and toward cinema's capacity for transcending the real world an approach to filmmaking sometimes called formalism. When we think of digital cameras, though, and consider what digital cameras allow us to accomplish that traditional film cameras don't, a wholly opposed set of characteristics emerges, all of which are associated with what we might call realism. First, digital cameras are, on average, smaller and more portable than film cameras, thus making it easier for highly mobile, on-location filmmaking. 
Taking the cameras into the streets of war-torn Italy was a hallmark of cinema's most famous realist movement, Italian neorealism. Digital realism continues this tradition. Think of the shaky camera work associated with dogma films like The Celebration, or the kinetic location shooting of Tangerine. These films not only continue the tradition of location shooting that's associated with Italian neorealism, but the shaky camera can connote a kind of rough DIY imperfection that is posed against the slick artifice of Hollywood. In Rombies' words, the pixelated shakiness of early digital cinema reminds us that the images on the screen are as frail and broken as we are. Traces of humanness in the era of digital cinema are preserved in the imperfections, deliberate and accidental. Second, digital cameras allow for longer takes. Conventionally, the longest take you can get with a film camera is about 20 minutes. But the storage capacity of a digital cartridge can last as long as an entire feature film, and then some. So it was only with digital cameras that you could make a film like 2002's Russian Ark, a 96-minute feature film that consists entirely of a single take without digital trickery. Long takes tend to be associated with cinematic realism because they preserve the world's continuous unfolding of time captured by the camera. In the words of realist film theorist Andre Bazan, long takes are based on respect for the continuity of dramatic space and, of course, of its duration. Third, digital cameras are less expensive than film cameras. And this has to do with the price of the camera itself, as well as what you record on, digital data as opposed to actual film. The price of digital cameras might not at first seem to have anything to do with realism. But consider that cheaper equipment means greater accessibility for a greater number of people, which makes it far easier for a more diverse body of stories to be told through the moving image. Think of the film Tangerine, whose advertising campaign emphasized the fact that it was shot on an iPhone, a digital device that, compared to a professional-grade movie camera, strongly signifies its accessibility to the masses. This not-so-little detail about Tangerine, a film about two sex workers who are both trans women of color, thus reinforces the film's association with the cinematic traditions of realism that often foreground stories about marginalized groups. More than just a gimmick, being shot on an iPhone is directly tied to Tangerine's aesthetic ambitions within the realist tradition. Just listen to the way that the film's director, Sean Baker, describes his goals in preserving real-life locations in making the film, which is a distinctly realist sensibility. It's been four years and a lot has changed. We were shooting at a time where this area was becoming gentrified. Now it's pretty much gentrified altogether. The whole film really builds up to this climactic confrontation that takes place with our entire ensemble cast at what was once donut time and now is actually owned by Danny Trejo and he's made it into Trejo's coffee and donuts. We always knew that donut time had to be a part of it. We didn't want to fake this at a donut shop on the other side of town. Baker's interest in documenting and thus preserving the material reality of locations like Donut Time is almost enhanced by the fact that Donut Time is no longer standing. The film Tangerine is thus both a fictional story, but also, in an important sense, a documentary of real-life places that mattered to the lives of real people, all captured with a digital device that many moviegoers use to document their own lives. But the film's digital realism isn't just a function of the camera or the location shooting. It's also a result of particular aesthetic choices. If we look at the very opening of the film, we can see these choices at a small scale. First, consider that the opening credits play over what at first appears to be a plain yellow background, but quickly reveals itself to be a scratched and worn surface of a table, at which our two main characters, Cindy and Alexandra, are sitting and chatting. This might not at first seem significant, but remember the film's realist ambition to document actual spaces like donut time. The scratches that we are forced to look at then are importantly also traces or indexes of history. Much like the medium of photography, those scratches testify to the existence of what was once there, the actual patrons of donut time that existed in the actual historical past. Consider also the framing of Cindy and Alexandra. Each of them is shot in a way that most of the frame is occupied by the window, through which we see the actual passersby in Los Angeles, who we can presume are not paid extras, but simply ordinary people who now happen to be in this movie. 
Even before we're given concrete plot information, the images themselves have told us that this film will blur the line between fiction and reality. It will rely on the material artifacts and human beings that populate our reality in order to tell a fictional story. And not only that, but the distinct visual qualities of the image produced by an iPhone extend this blurring of fiction and reality. The images that we're seeing look less like a feature film and more like the kinds of images that we take with our smartphones to document our own social realities. Even if you can't identify why the image looks the way it does, in this case it exhibits the distortions produced by a wide angle lens, slightly lower resolution, and occasional overexposure, you still feel those differences because you recognize this kind of image as a deeply familiar one. In these ways, Tangerine helps show us that the digital video realism that emerged in the 90s and early 2000s is very much still alive. Tangerine's distinctly realist sensibility is inextricable from its use of ordinary digital devices to record its images. So when we take a step back, we should note that what Rombies calls the double logic of digital cinema is not that new. In fact, it's really a return to the double logic of reality and fantasy, realism and formalism that was always there since the very beginning of the cinematic medium. Within the first 10 years of projected moving images, the dichotomy between reality and fantasy had already started to form. On the realism side of things, the films of the Lumiere brothers were associated with the medium's capacity to record the actual world unfolding in front of the camera. On the fantasy side, the films of Georges Méliès used that same medium to play with reality, to portray things that never could appear or occur in the physical world. What the double logic of digital cinema reminds us then is that while we tend to pin down the essence of technologies or media when they're new to us, we should always remember that those very technologies will likely exceed the definitions that we initially give them.